Geelong coach Chris Scott has often been vocal around the so-called inequalities in the AFL. He once again spoke up when asked about the opening round and its effects on the competition. Do you have a view, Chris, on whether playing the eight and leaving ten on the shelf and then what happens next further impacts the integrity of the of the fixture? Oh, well, of course it does. But like with a lot of these things, is it is it... Is the juice worth a squeeze? And in this case, it it probably is. But, yeah, let's just be honest. And, of course, it compromises it, but it might be worth it. I want to push on what you just said, Dan, the compromise. I don't know if you said the word compromise. I'll say it's compromise. You know, this week, for example, this week, for example, Melbourne are playing the Western Bulldogs. Western Bulldogs haven't played a game, and Melbourne have played a game of football. Is 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 that an advantage to Melbourne to get that one game under the belt to play against a team who hasn't yet to play at the, the high level? Oh, maybe, maybe. But I, I think the bigger compromise is that those teams get two buys compared to every other team. And if, if you ask the players, and this has gone on for a long time, the Players Association pushed the AFL to bring back the two buys, and the answer was always there was no time. But now they've found the time. Nah, that's, that's the frustrating that. part. And like compromise sometimes is a... It, gets a... it was an interesting perspective. I think the main issue people had was what Mark Robinson mentioned, surrounding one team playing an official game while one team didn't. But clearly the eight teams that do get a second bye was the big focus for Scott. And like he said, maybe the compromise is worth it for the betterment of the competition. Focusing on Robinson's point around teams playing before others, let's see what happened in round one. GWS hosted North Melbourne and in a pretty open game, they won by 39 points. Gold Coast hosted Adelaide, dominating most of the match until a last quarter comeback put the Crows within a goal. On Sunday, Melbourne played the Western Bulldogs at the MCG and pulled away late to win by 45 points. And in the final game of the round, Fremantle upset Brisbane at Optus Oval. So for the games that had one side play another who hadn't played, three of the four did win. Now there are so many variables in each game, it's impossible to find correlation at this stage. If opening round continues in this format, then keeping track of these results for a few seasons could then uncover if it seems one team has an advantage over another. But for now, it's still too hard to say if any impact is really there. Now the second buy is a legitimate point. You can argue it's still incredibly early in the year but having a week off isn't just for rest. A great case study for this will be the Brisbane Lions. At 0-2, Chris Fagan himself said their round two bye was a great chance to reset and figure out how to improve upon their slow start. How do you feel about the, the early bye? Chris, is it handy in some ways for you to be able to get to work on a few of those things? It is now, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if I'd have won the first two games, I'd probably say, I don't want that bye. But um, it, it probably will be just to take a bit of a, a, a breath in and, and um, work out a few things. I mean, we had a Hypothetically, if the Lions take off and win five in a row, then it's fair to say the bye allowed them to regroup, get Lockie Neal healthy and gain some momentum. But again, maybe it won't have any impact. In another world, say this bye didn't exist. It means Brisbane would be facing Collingwood at the Gabba in a pivotal match to avoid becoming 0-3. The pressure would be extreme and their turnaround from the Fremantle loss would be quick. It's just a thought to keep in mind. Having an extra week off in principle is an advantage. Scott argued that the AFL had rejected ideas for a second bye noting time issues. However, in 2024, they clearly have found time for eight AFL teams. The reality is the AFL is heavily compromised. Certain clubs have advantages over others. The draft itself has wildcard features and the final game of the year is played in the same stadium. Sometimes compromise is needed. Chris Scott himself has one huge advantage. How about Geelong's very own stadium? Hawthorne, Richmond, and Carlton all play home games at the MCG too. But do they have a secondary stadium? No. Now Geelong is a large city in itself 
and can fill out the stadium most weeks. If you are going to complain about compromise and fairness, then I don't see how it's all equal that you get to play 9 AFL games at GMHBA, a place in which you win 83% of the time. But because the Cats fill it out and they are their own city, the AFL compromises for this specific circumstance. It is interesting that Scott is vocal on quite a few issues, but rarely if ever seems to highlight his own club's advantage. Sticking with stadiums, having the grand final at the MCG to other sporting codes would seem unfair. Surely it's the team that has the highest position on the ladder that gets to host the game. Or like the NFL, have a rotating number of neutral venues to play the game at. In a perfect world, both of these ideas make sense, but where else can we hold 100,000 plus people? The grand final for the AFL is as much a corporate and business event as it is a football one, and playing it at say Giant Stadium wouldn't get near the commercial revenue needed for such a big day. It also keeps tradition in the sport, even if it is mainly for Victorians. We focus back on Chris Scott for the final big piece of, in his own words, compromisation, the AFL draft. So there is a mechanism of equalisation within the competition already. If you finish second last, you get second pick in the draft. And they've had that for a number of years now yep. because they chose to go down a certain path. Mm. But the AFL pretty quickly has got to get to the point, in my view, where they just get out of the way and let the system operate without this blatant manipulation. Out of all that was previously mentioned, this is the biggest compromise in our league. Whether it's the draft concessions that North Melbourne got, or the father-son rule which helped Collingwood pick up Nick and Josh Dacos, these adjustments have the biggest impact. They can help good sides still be able to pick up gun young players, while sometimes limiting teams at the bottom from being able to select from the entire draft pool. The AFL has put limits around the NGA in recent time and created heavier prices in terms of draft points for father-son or academy picks. But in reality, the system benefits clubs that can get lucky with certain prospects. But again, all this points back to the health of the game itself. We just have to live with these things to ensure club bloodlines carry on with fathers and sons and the New South Wales and Queensland clubs continue to grow with talent blossomed from their own backyards. It's for the betterment of the game in the AFL's mind. Chris Scott is surely not the only AFL coach, GM or football boss that thinks a lot of our game is unbalanced. It's just the way things are. Gather Round adds another hurdle in all of this and imagine when Tasmania comes in and gets handed a whole lot of draft picks. But for all the complaining by some, we've gotten through it. Each club has their own issues, and while some do have advantages here and there, I think most people would agree the competition is very even and has been for the past few years. Repeat premiers haven't been seen for three seasons now, and I actually think that is a great sign. Sure, the AFL is compromised, a little unfair or unequal, or throw in any term like this, but you can't fault the competition in trying to make itself as competitive as possible, something that compared to a lot of other leagues in the world, the AFL has done a pretty good job at.